Good morning and welcome to today's virtual payer panel. My name is Scott Hazelton. I'm the director of marketing at UHIN. I've been here for three and a half years and oversaw the previous two HIT conferences here in Salt Lake City. Uh, I'm excited as we're looking at those in attendance to see so many familiar faces who are joining us in the virtual experience this morning. We also, of course, have two outstanding panelists whom we will introduce shortly, uh, but a few notes about the payer panel uh, before we get started. So for the past 30 years, UHIN has convened communities and providers and payers and stakeholders um, in events similar to this. Uh, this is one of the first virtual payer panels that we've done, but it won't be our last. We have a few more coming up, so make sure to keep your eyes on your inbox or subscribe to our newsletter, join us on LinkedIn. Uh, and you'll get more info. So the and I and I do want to thank everybody at UN who has worked so hard to bring uh, this payer panel online and make this happen today. Thank you. Uh, the payer panel is an opportunity for health plans and provider representatives to share updates that may impact your particular area of healthcare, and for providers, those in attendance, to ask questions uh, in a way that you might not have the opportunity to do. Uh, during the rest of the year. I'd like to now introduce our panelists. We have Lori Weber, uh, Education Representative, Part B, Provider Education at Noridian Healthcare Solutions, LLC. And we have Melissa Shoemaker, Senior Network Engagement Representative, Provider Development at Select Health. I'll pass the microphone to Lori to introduce herself further, followed by Melissa, and then we'll do dive into today's updates and Q&A. Uh, Lori, do you want to get us started? Thank you, Scott, and hello, everyone. I cannot see your faces, so I'm sure there are people in the audience that I have met before, and I just want to thank Scott and his team for inviting us today, and we hope that we um, address your questions and also, we have some information also to share. Now, for those of you that might be newer in the last couple of years, your POB rep from Meridian Medicare was Erin Swadener, and she has left the company. Well, a couple of years ago, I actually gave her Utah so I could take Hawaii. So it was kind of a nice trade. Well, I'm back. So... Um, <laughs> Anyway, I'm excited to be back because I love working with Utah So and the UN. We're excited and to be back. I've been here, I forgot to par say that part, I've been here about 19 years, I guess, working in education at Noridian Medicare. So I know a, a little bit about everything and not a lot about anything. <laughs> so thanks, Scott. Hi, I'm Melissa Shoemaker. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to, to log in and chat with us for a little bit. So um, I think today our, our goal is just to have an open forum um, where we can kind of get some information out to you guys, um, answer some, you know, some broad spectrum questions that you may have, um, as well as kind of update you on some of our processes. Um, so at Select Health, we do have multiple different network engagement reps depending on your clinic's location. Um, so even though I may not be your particular network rep, um, I'm happy to try to answer any questions that you may have or help direct you to your dedicated rep um, if you need further follow-up. Thank you. So... I'm happy to um, tap into some of the questions that were asked in advance and then open up the lines to everybody in attendance. Uh, unless Lori or Melissa, there's maybe particular topics that you're, you've are you been hearing all year, burning questions from other providers that may pertain uh, to those in attendance today that you wanna touch on. Otherwise I'll get into the questions. I, I think I'm good just to jump right in. I'm good as well. All right. Thank you. you bet. I am going to try to share my screen here. Can everybody see the questions on the screen? Yes. Perfect. So thank you to everybody who submitted questions in advance. 
The first is, can you provide an update regarding POS and modifiers for billing telehealth video conferencing and telehealth audio only? And are there any changes anticipated for 2025? Lori, do you want to kick this one off? Sure. Um, just to answer the second question first, we can't talk about, in Medicare, we can't talk about the anticipated 2025 changes until we see the final rule, which is really soon. Uh, it should be by the second week of November. But if you've been following the uh, proposed rules, uh, you would see any kind of updates there. Now, the updates for 24, we had telehealth presentations and we also have a browse by topic uh, telehealth um, page on our website. And mostly what happened in 24 was to use place of service 02 um, when the beneficiaries at, a, at, um, at another place besides their home and then a place of service 10 when they're in their home. Uh, both of these dropped the modifier. And I can certainly get this all written up uh, for Scott to share with the group. Um, as far as select health, I will I will mimic what Lori stated that yes, the the place of services um, 10 and 2 are probably the the biggest update that we've seen um, in regards to the modifiers are no longer needed. Um, there were some claims with Select Health that you may see start to reprocess. So previous um, to this newest update, the telehealth services were paying at our facility rate, which would be our lower allowed amounts. Um, with this change, it, Place of Service 10 now does pay um, the same as if you would see a client in office. So there will um, there are reports being ran on our end that will grab any claims that process with the facility allowed amount to reprocess them at our higher allowed amount. So you'll start seeing those come in. Gosh, if I had to guess, I would say probably within the next 45 to 60 days, you'll start seeing some of those on your remittances. Thank you. And I will mention, uh, we will follow up after this webinar with an email to everybody who attended. Uh, we'll include a link to the screen recording and uh, answers to these, uh, to these questions. Um, moving on, for Select Health. We have a contract and thus we are not required to do prior auths. How do we get approval for the ABA treatment codes? Or do we just bill and not worry about it? Um, so with a contract with Select Health, that doesn't necessarily mean that a prior authorization is not required. Um, what your contract does do is it states which networks you are considered in network for with us. Um, so, so yes, while there is, you know, there are um, some language in the contract about prior authorizations, it doesn't necessarily mean that a certain CPT code um, paired with a certain ICD-10 would not need a prior authorization. Um, if there's one in particular that you are wondering about on our website under our provider tab, there is a section that you can put in the member's ID number and the CPT code to find out if they need a prior authorization. Otherwise, there are lists on there um, under code lists, and it, it designates them out by state. Um, so you would just click on the Utah one for commercial plans or Medicaid or Medicare, um, and it will give you a complete list that you're able to search by CPT code to tell you if it does, A, if it's covered, and B, if it does need a prior authorization. Next question. Who do I contact to get my email updated in a payers system? And Melissa, I can take that one if you want first. Um, so this depends if you're talking about our listserv which you can go in on our home pages, depending if you're in a J, well, you're 
you're all in JF. And you can update any of your information in that listserv. If you're talking about enrollment under the online uh, PECO system, uh, because I don't quite know if they have an email in there, but I'm assuming, uh, then you definitely want to check with enrollment. And if you're talking about the Neridian Medicare portal, where someone may have left your business or your clinic, or they may have, or maybe you're adding someone um, as a user or administrator, then you'd want to check with the uh, Neridian portal. And there's also information on the homepage where you can click in and contact those, that staff. And I would say that um, for Select Health, the answer would be similar to Lori's. So if it is an EDI where you need a new login, uh, because every every employee that is in your organization that's logging in should have their own unique login. So if you need to um, have a new employee get a login, you would contact our EDI department. Um, if it's in the system for other reasons, whether it's where the contract is getting sent for one of your providers, um, where you want the newsletter sent to, I would suggest reaching out to your dedicated network engagement rep and have them, just there's multiple different areas that it would need to be updated depending on where what specifically um, you know, you're needing to go to a new email address. So if you contact your network engagement rep that's specific to your clinic, they would be able to get that updated for you. Thank you both. That's so helpful. Our next question. Does Medicare Part B cover 90611 Genios? <laughs> this is a great one. Well, we just started a couple of years ago when monkeypox was discovered. <laughs> and this is an administration code, um, also for uh, smallpox. And we have a, a complete webinar, not just on monkeypox, but we've added it into our COVID webinar. So if you go out on our webinars on demand, uh, we last presented that, I think, yee, might have been a year ago in December. But you can look at that and it will give you all the information and how to build the monkeypox um, administration along with, uh, you know, the requirements. That's great. Thank you. I'm supposed to call it mpox, not monkeypox anymore. <laughs> ah, good to know. Um. We have a question. This one's a, a little bit longer and I can read it out, but I have the, the gist of it here for you all. Um, one of our attendees is receiving denials for the flu shot, 90660 and 661, and the administration of the shot due to age restrictions. Uh, they are wondering if there is a fix in place uh, for these denials. And again, I can give you a little bit more detail. I can, the, I can begin speaking on that, Scott. Sure. Okay. Um, so as far as select health, um, yes, initially we did receive some claim denials on that um, due to how it was loaded into the system that claims runs through. That has been corrected on our end. And again, um, a system-wide query has been ran to grab any of those claim denials and then reprocess them. So as far as um, there doesn't need to be any resubmission for those, we will just automatically start reprocessing those. And for Neridian, I wasn't aware there was an issue. So maybe this was just for Select Health. But I will say, if you're talking about... Um, you know, the young, uh, because our flu shots, you know, are broke out by age groups. If you're talking the six months to 35 months or something, you'd want to make sure that that, um, that that child was a Medicare beneficiary uh, based on disability, et cetera. So um, that would be the only way that we would pay at Meridian B. That's great. Thank you. 
next one. Can you build a TC or 26 modifier on a UB04? Melissa, do you want to take that one? Because I represent part B. So I would have to ask my counterparts in part A because I don't know. Well, I was hoping you would take it, Lori. Because <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> my answer um, would be the same as yours, uh, as of the yes, because that, you know, would not be something that a network engagement rep would handle. Um, if there, if you're having a specific issue, if you have a claim denial, um, certainly reach out to your network engagement rep and they can kind of help facilitate getting that over to the correct department. They can look at that claim specifically um, and, and give you some direction from there. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you. And, and I know with part, part B, we have uh, fee schedules that have indicators and descriptors that you can type in a search of any HICPICS or any CPT. And then they give you this whole row that says, is it an active code? What's the global days, if any? And one of the first columns is about, can it be split into TCP uh, 26, into technical and professional? So you really want to look at each code individually because some are global and some are priced uh, technical and uh, professional, if that helps. That's great. This one is for Medicare Part B non-payable codes. Should we still be using 90471 and 72? Ooh, I think I'm getting ready to cover that in my drugs and bios in November. Uh, either in part one or part two, because there's so much with drugs and bios. Uh, this is usually just used, this administration, for the tetanus. Um, and of course, we don't cover just uh, screening tetanus uh, vaccinations. That has to be a wound or a burn, something that went on. And we'll talk about it in that presentation. So I recommend that although we already have over 300 people signed up, that you want to maybe register for um, part one or part two or both of our drugs and biologicals. And that registration's on our website. Yes, make sure to go there. But and register. Oh, I have another caveat I just thought of. Thank you. Um, but if you're billing flu, to, to Neridian Medicare um, or any MAC, you need to be billing with those HIPPIC G codes for administration. So the G0008 for flu, 0009 for uh, pneumonia, and for hep B, I think it's G0010. So that's, so these nine zero codes would not be payable in those um, aspects. That's great, and and Julie uh, in attendance is is letting us know to this question that uh, she or at her clinic they use uh, these admins for non payable immunizations with a GY modifier. Oh, I see. Okay, excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Our next question. What is the current status of your response to the change healthcare incidents? What are the action items for providers and your health plan moving forward? I'll let you take it, Melissa, unless you want me to go first. <laughs> no. So, I, um, so yes, obviously, um, Select Health is is very aware of change healthcare and the incident that happened earlier this year. Um, so we have not released our final plan of action to move forward, but as soon as that becomes public, then we will um, have that on our website as well as send, be sending that out in our newsletter to all of our providers. And for Neridian, we have uh, information on our website that addressed this clear back, I think it was February, right? Um, we consider it resolved as far as 
our part in, in April 24th. Uh, we transitioned providers to the Optin EDI Clearinghouse, and we're continuing to monitor and assess any potential threats. Um, and then I'll have a link that I can give to Scott when we do this whole presentation that you will have for your um, for your reference. That'd be great. Thank you. I know it was uh, not something anticipated in everybody's plan for 2024. And no. you know, over here, there have been so many people from enrollment and, and figuring out uh, how to keep those claims flowing who have put in so much time and effort and overtime. So thank you all for your hard work on that. So in regard to prior auth, can you provide more information on prior authorization for repetitive scheduled non-emergent ambulance transport under change request 13711? I can take that first, if you don't mind, Melissa. Uh, in January of 25, uh, what this change request CR 137 is, is it removes the option to request expedited prior auth review and to change the time frame from 10 business days down to seven calendar days under the uh, RASNOT a RASNAT PA model. And I don't know if that's answering it or uh, there is more information. In fact, we just had, I want to say last month, we had the ambulance uh, RASNAT webinar. So you can find more information on our website and I will, I will get that all for you. And maybe a copy of that uh, ambulance presentation. Perfect. Um, and I don't believe I have any additional information to add other than what Lori's already stated. Sounds good. We can move to the next one. So in November, EDI Support Services is implementing a required annual recertification of all provider vendor EDI enrollments. How will that work and what can we do to prepare? Do you want to take that one, Lori? Sure. I just didn't want to, you know, say I have to be first every time. So You're good. Just... Go for it. <laughs> well, this is coming soon, and they are working on a tool for providers to log in uh, and a lookup tool as well. So um, EDI, if you look at, and you may want to write this part down, even though I'll give you the full uh, link, later is EDISS, and that's Electronic Interchange System Support. And that gets you into the Noridian webinar EDI system, um, or homepage, I should say. And on there, they've got, um, you know, that this enrollment is gonna have an annual recertification. It is gonna start in November, and we are gonna be adding a slide in education that helps uh, promote this so that everybody's aware. It's it's kind of like, um, and hopefully it won't be like your revalidations that you have to do an enrollment, which is quite a, um, a long um, process, but this, um, this should be fairly short and they are gonna do it annually. I asked them and I said, Wow, every year, huh? People have to prove that all the players are the same. And uh, so that's how it prepares. Make sure that you've got your trading ID number ready, your NPI number, that the MPES website is updated with all the current addresses, that it all matches in PECOS so that EDI will know that. Um, are there any changes in your players? you know, your CEOs or physicians or anybody like that that's, that's uh, or staff that's included in this EDI information. So yeah, just all the regular prep type of stuff. Great, great answer, Lori. Um, yes, 
I would I would mimic what Lori said is just make sure that when the time come does come to update that that you've got all of your information um, ready to update and then if anything directly needs to come from Select Health you'll be receiving an email through our EDI department. Oh yes, I forgot that part, Melissa. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, you you will you will know when in your when it's your time to recertify. So, um, yeah, we have a couple raised hands um, and a quest a question from Tracy. She's wondering if how she's wondering how that will affect billing services that do not have an MPI. Well, if you're a billing service. Um, you should have access and if otherwise it shouldn't be coming to you right i mean it should be going to the provider's address i th i think i don't know if they if you have a way to open up their phone line or anything yeah you know what? Or i could be misunderstanding the question not to not to uh have her answer for everybody in her position out there, Tracy. But if you want to, <laughs> you can you can speak, and uh, you're live with us right now. <laughs> if you want to provide a little more context to uh, to that question, go ahead. We can unmute you. Um, yeah, just we do have a trading partner number. We just don't have an NPI. But so we have been assigned to be the administrator. I forget the exact term for EDISS. Um, we're the administrator or whatever for several of our clients. So I guess I'm just wondering, I, do the clients need to recertify as well? Or because we're like their admin recertification people, can we do that? And I guess if we can, does that mean we need to do it per NPI. Does that all make sense? <laughs> it makes sense, but you know, I don't have that answer. So um, I can find out from EDI and let you know. That would be lovely. Want, or if you don't want to wait, <laughs> you can call the, the, the customer service line and ask for EDI. <laughs> I can do that. That's no problem. <laughs> well, Thank yeah, you. Uh, you bet. It was a great question. I just, I don't know. They did not give us that. And Brittany, uh, Brittany Scott, great last name, uh, might have something to add to this as well. Brittany, if you want to go ahead and ask Lori or Melissa, go ahead. Do you need to unmute her, Scott? It's up to Brittany. Okay. Brittany, we can circle back uh, if you have a question or something to add. So moving to our next question. Um, it's in regard to updates to telehealth POS. Can you provide guidance on POS 02 and 10 and exceptions? Um, you want I, me to, oh, go ahead, Melissa. Sorry, yes, absolutely. Um, so I'm not sure if this question is just regarding what place of service to use um, with the new guidelines, um, but I believe Lori stated earlier, so place of service 10 is when the member or the patient is in their home. Place of service is when they um, reside outside of their home. And as far as exceptions to that, I do know that Select Health um, will, if, if you're referring to modifiers, um, the modifiers are not required. If they are on there, um, you know, they will be, they will, it won't deny the claim, but they will look at the claim and it will trigger um, that they, the differential of the facility allowed amounts um, get implemented. I'm not sure if that answers that specific question um, or not, but if there's something more specific on it, 
um, you can feel free to follow up after after this presentation with with the specific question if that didn't cover it. And I echo what Melissa said about place of service uh, 0, 2, and 10. Our exceptions are if you're an outpatient um, therapy service, like a physical therapist, out, um, occupational therapist, or speech language pathologist, then you're supposed to use your actual place of service, for example, office of 11, as if the patient was seen at your site. And so that's not the same as O2 or 10 that everyone else does. And then they're asking for you to append a modifier 95 on those. The other exception is outpatient hospital clinicians, mm -hmm. where you might have a place of service on campus of 22, off campus of 19, mm -hmm. and those services when the patient's in their home, again, you can append modifier 95. And we'll get that all written out in the final. That's great. Good question. Thank you for the answers. Good question. In regards to enrollment, can you share more info on enrollment timelines and how to submit applications? And, and for this one, I... When I uh, did a little search, I did find that uh, our enrollment page does have a time frame under <laughs> applications uh, right on the page. So um, it depends if an on-site is needed. Uh, on-site visits are needed for what they call suppliers. So ambulances and DME, durable medical equipment, et cetera. Um, so it's approximately 15 to 60 days. So I know that's quite a span. And um, I did not have a chance to find out if we're um, up to date. You know, a lot of times enrollment will, will just be so far behind because of volume or whatever. So um, that's all I have. Thank you. So start to finish for credentialing. Um, our current timeline is about 180 days. Um, I know that probably is not the popular answer at the, mo <laughs> the moment or well-liked, um, but due to a couple of different issues on our part, um, part of that is Select Health's expansion into other states, as well as a data, data management system that we implemented last fall um, that that should have you know, significantly tied all of our different systems together. Um, probably like most new systems that are enrolled, um, there have been some challenges with it and it has actually created some additional operational deficiencies. So we are as a company wide um, with every department involved currently you know, diligently working on that to get those timelines down. Um, but we think it's really important to give everyone a realistic expectation of, of where we are as of today um, with, with the great hope that soon we'll be able to uh, give you an update and that that timeline will be much shorter. That's great. That's a helpful answer and we can hear you perfectly now. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I will keep you, Melissa. Uh, yes. We have a question about Select Health. Um, and an issue with demographic information being inaccurate. And so therefore, um, this uh, person in attendance today is getting denied claims or having issues with getting authorization. They're having to fix uh, these issues pretty consistently. Um, absolutely. So if, as far as demographic information on Select Health side, um, when a claim goes through our system, it does... I will say fact checked several points of information off of the claim. Um, the billing or remit address is one of those, the physical location of the address, um, as well as obviously tax ID, NPI. But if those, if those are not matching up, then yes, it could cause a claim denial. Now those 
may have been changes that you've already submitted to your representative and they've just not been updated in our system yet. Um, and so that would be causing, you know, some claim issues. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if it is something that, you know, you've submitted to your, your network engagement rep, they've said, great, we've got it past your committee meeting, it was approved, and you're still getting denials on those, I would recommend um, reaching out directly to your rep, give them a claim example, and then that way we can pull it up, make sure that it's accurate in the claims data processing system, um, as well as try to get it updated um, on the directory. I know that our directory with our data management system that's being implemented um, is not accurate as we would like. Um, and some of those changes that we have implemented aren't being uploaded onto the directory system. So if you're seeing them there as well, um, it, it is a known issue for us. And like I said, if you reach out directly out to your dedicated rep, they can kind of work on the back end of getting that updated. Uh, one more question for EDISS research, and this is probably one we can get back to you on. If we submit through a clearinghouse like you, Hen, do both of us need to recertify? Uh, Pebble, good to see you on here. Been a while. Um, we will uh, we'll get in touch with you and, and shoot you an answer on that, unless uh, Lori or Melissa uh, have any kind of insight right off the bat. Me, it's kind of like the billing service question. Yeah. I'm gonna have to find out from EDI how they how they're gonna do that with clearing houses and billing services. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh we have a question um about H2019. It's not billable to Medicare and most insurances. Do you know if there's a replacement code that would be covered? What's what's the code? H zero two one nine. H two zero one nine. Not off the top of my head. How about you, Melissa? Um, I do not. I'm looking at our publications, and I don't have anything currently on that. Okay. We are going to jot that one down and find the right people to follow up. We have a question for Select Health uh, in regards to sending in an appeal, what documents are needed for it, especially for clients who have monthly per diems? Um, I would probably need a little bit more info on the monthly per diems. Yeah. However, I can tell you with the appeal process, if you are able to log on to our portal, you're able to attach any documentation you may have, whether that be obviously your chart note. Um, if there is a prior authorization that perhaps did not link up to the claim immediately, you could update that. Um, any referral letters that you may need, any there is any documentation that you have, you're able to upload through our portal on that specific claim. Thank you. And, and Scott, I can go back to the H2019 if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. I was just uh, glancing at uh, what it might be equal to in Medicare. Is it, it looks like it's a behavioral health, um, a therapeutics uh, service in a group setting. So you might be running into CPT 90853 or something on that line. Now that's group psychotherapy, but if it's behavior, oh gosh, we have a two-part mental health presentation that's out on our webinars on demand, and it really goes into all that. And we also have a behavioral health intervention or a BHI presentation <laughs> that my colleague does, and I can get all that information in the final as well. That's so helpful. Thank you. You bet. A question on eligibility. 
is there anywhere online eligibility that we can check when the patient had their last preventative visit? Asking because payers typically allow one preventative billed each year at either 365 days from the previous visit or one in a calendar year. And Melissa, I can take that one. Uh, yeah, we have uh, the Neridian Medicare portal that will give, oh gosh, not all, but most of the preventive services and tell you when that patient last had it. That's why it's so important to utilize that portal. Um, and I'm not sure which preventive service you're talking about, but some of them are not annual. Some of them, depending on the risk, if it's medium or high risk, they maybe can have every six months or maybe like your colonoscopies uh, five, every five or 10 years. Um, you know, same with your vaccines. I mean, the pneumonia vaccine is not, is not allowed every year, you know. So it just depends on what, what codes you're, you're wanting to know about. Maybe we could get those details. Um, thanks, Lori. Uh, yes, as far as select health claims, um, we always encourage providers to use our portal as well. Um, if, it's, if that's something you need to request access to, um, you can certainly contact your rep and they can get you over the necessary forms to get um, you access to that. You're also able to call our member services line. Um, but I, I will say that looking it up on the portal um, would probably be a more time efficient aspect for you, um, as sometimes our call, our call times do get quite long. And Michelle asked that question, uh, keeping with our traditional format where they could uh, speak to you directly. I'll let her go ahead and add it. any more context. Awesome. Thank you, Scott. So I apologize. This is in reference to pediatric visits outside of the um, newborn visits. So the issue I run into is sometimes with kindergarten visits where they need their immunizations um, before school registration and say they had their last well care visit that was billed in maybe December of the previous year. So we do pull eligibility at time of service, but if they hadn't been seen by my clinic, obviously I don't always have record of when they were last seen. And a lot of times parents don't reference when their last visit was. So some carriers, I know Select Health has given a little more leeway with that. Um, they give us about three months of a overlay on the last preventative. But other carriers, typically it is 365 with maybe a 30 day. So I'm just wondering if there's anywhere online without having to call on each carrier to ask when the last preventative visit was done, if it wasn't done in my office. Sure, absolutely. Um, I may connect you, Michelle, after this to, to someone in our claims or our eligibility that can give you a, a more complete answer on on that particular situation as far as being able to pull up from you know a, a broader spectrum than I think you're probably able to see on the portal. Is that is that the issue that you're running into? Yeah, absolutely. Because they'll, you know, we can see that they're eligible, but it won't be paid as a preventative if it's been done too soon from the previous, if that makes sense. Sure. Absolutely. So I hate I would rather let educate patients and push them back you know, by a month or whatever, if needs be to make sure that that's covered by their insurance. Right. Yeah. And so I don't, I need to be able to see that information, even if it wasn't done at my clinic at to help advise. Specifically. Sure. Yeah. Let me, um, I'm going to connect you with someone after this that can help walk you through a better process for that. Perfect. Thank you. Absolutely. We, uh, we have about eight minutes left. Hopefully we can get to at least two more questions. One is a follow-up actually looking at the Medicare age patients. Uh, if you're checking Neridian for the last wellness visits, will that show only Medicare age patients? Yes. We we don't have access to the, to the whole world. I mean, right. yeah, it would just be your, and it doesn't even have to be Medicare age. If they're under the end stage renal disease, if they're under disabled, uh, certain disabled, they're on Medicare. So as long as they're Medicare beneficiaries, then the portal will will bring up their information. So great question. 
That's great. Thank you. I know um, a number of people in attendance are asking if Select Health can send the information about the preventative visits uh, to everybody who's attended. So yes, we will have follow up and places for you to go to um, refer uh, refer to in the future with all this information and great answers from Lori and Melissa. Um, we have a question about a behavioral clinic that is going to start billing all payers for drug screens for the first time. Do you have any recommendations to prevent denials? Will there be authorizations required? And does Medicare only cover the G codes for the drug screens? Ooh, this, I'm gonna take that one, Melissa. <laughs> this one is, uh, it, it can't be answered in just a couple sentences because there's so many. But Marina, I see it's from Marina Alvarez. Yeah. I would like, Scott, if you could put me in touch with her. Okay. Because I'm just finalizing our drug uh, presentation for November 12th. And I, if this is something that I need to get in there that I don't have in there, um, I would like to get it in in the next two days. So um, we're actually having a meeting right after this. So. Um, with my Part A colleague. We have a question about, and this might be the last one as we're nearing time, a uh, question regarding the 91304 code uh, and, and problems with UHC not paying these correctly. Well, pick me on the 91304. <laughs> <laughs> Back in October of 23, I believe, uh, this was an updated Novavax uh, COVID-19 vaccine for patients 12 and older. So um, there's all kinds of information should be on our website uh, that it is payable and you use the 90480 to build the administration. So with that, I'm also, I'm going to recommend that everybody sign up for the Medicare Learning Network email that comes out weekly because, you know, same with our Meridian listserv, what doesn't apply to you, you can just ignore, but this is where you would have seen all this great information. And then what we try to do at Meridian is then um, either add it to the web page or include it in the next presentation, you know, those sort of things, write an article, um, but we don't always do it for everything. So it just depends. So if you have this, it really, really helps. So hopefully that answers your question. Yes. And with, uh, with a follow-up email, we're going to be sending out to everybody who's attended with that. We'll be sure to include links where you can register for what webinars that, uh, Lori, uh, mentioned and, and links to, other documents you can reference that Melissa and Lori mentioned. So uh, please be on the lookout for those. Um, and I think you've mentioned as well, Lori and Melissa, there are places on the website that they can visit to kind of stay stay up on all of this information. Is that right? Absolutely. Okay. And your contact information. I know you, you love talking to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, send it out there. What I don't do is I don't give out my phone number. And the reason is, is because I'm either on a call like this or I'm talking to providers or I'm presenting a webinar or attending. I just don't want to play phone mail, phone uh, tag. So um, please feel free to share my email, laurie.weber at neridian.com. Absolutely. So we have a minute, uh, Melissa. Melissa. Uh, do you have anything you want to uh, add or, or mention for everybody before uh, we're done here? No, I think I will just um, thank everyone for attending and just encourage you to watch for that follow-up email. Um, I'm also going to have Scott, because Select Health does do um, our territories and our, our splits, sometimes are a little confusing as far as, gosh, who exactly is my network engagement rep? I'll include um, kind of a little a cheat sheet per se um, that gives you the contact information for, you know, each rep and what area or what county they cover. Um, right. And it will have their email address and their direct phone number on there as well. 
So, and it, and if it's still, you know, you're like, oh gosh, I don't know. We have 14 different locations. I don't know which one I'm supposed to go to. Um, just contact me and I'll, I'll gladly help direct you to the right person. Amazing. Thank you. And Lori, is there anything uh, you wanted to mention? Um, I'm the education rep for Part B for Utah, so that makes it a little easier. But I'm also supposed to always preface that even though I love getting your emails and I want to help, I'm only one person. So it won't be immediate. And our um, management says you must call the call center first. Um, and then if you can't get your answers then you can ask to be tiered up to your education rep. So, um, and if you ever need just a personal uh, presentation for your group on any subject, because if I don't know it, I'll learn it, um, that Medicare covers, um, then please, you know, reach out. So thank you, Scott. And I just, again, want to thank all of you for attending today. This was very well attended and, um, it's good to be back in Utah. <laughs> thank it's you. It's good to have you back here. And Melissa, <laughs> thank you as well for attending. I'm glad we could uh, troubleshoot and have you here. Your, your guidance and advice, uh, both of you, thank you so much. And for everybody who attended and asked questions, thank you so much. We will be in touch uh, with a follow-up. And I hope you'll join us in our uh, next pair panel. Be on the lookout for that. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everyone.